God Consciousness versus Subconsciousness The analysis of the errors with which all human beings have to deal is often of great practical importance, since it enables us the more intelligently to apply our knowledge of God in their correction. As Mrs. Eddy says in Science and Health, page 252, a knowledge of error and its operations must precede that understanding of truth which destroys error. The organs of the human body are not self-controlled. If they were, the organs of a corpse would be self-acting. It is also evident that the organs of the body are not under the control of the conscious mind, for the beating of the heart, the digestion of food, and other so-called involuntary bodily processes go on without any seeming dependence upon our conscious mentality. Furthermore, it is clear to students of Christian science that God does not create nor directly or consciously attend to the activities of the material body. Nevertheless, the activities of the bodily organs evidence intelligence and plan of an intricate and complex order. Since this intelligence is evidently not an expression of the divine consciousness, though Christian scientists know it to be a counterfeit of God-intelligence, and since it is not conscious human intelligence, the intelligence which controls the bodily organs and functions is spoken of by students of the human mind as subconsciousness, indicating that its activities are beneath the activity or observation of the conscious mind. The so-called subconscious mind is a part of the makeup of every human being, though most human beings give little or no thought to its existence, or to the nature and laws of its activity on the human plane. Furthermore, it has been discovered that the subconscious mind gradually takes its character from the activity of the conscious mind. The conscious mind is, as it were, a feeder of the subconsciousness, which accumulates and stores up that which it is fed. Thus it becomes the seat of what is called habit, along many different lines. There is an Eastern proverb, said to be thousands of years old, which reads, If a man commits a sin, let him not do it again. Let him not delight in it. The accumulation of evil is painful. It is fair to say that the subconsciousness of a young child is largely formed and determined by the belief of inheritance from human ancestors and by prenatal influences of the mother's thought and feeling. As the child grows older, its own conscious mental activity and its mental environment enter more and more largely into the shaping of its subconsciousness. Accordingly, it is apparent that the subconsciousness of an adult is partly the result of the belief of inheritance, partly the result of mental environment, and largely the result of daily conscious activity. If the conscious mind, to a large extent, entertains fear, anxiety, doubt, grief, discouragement, lust, greed, hatred, malice, envy, jealousy, revenge, pride, and the like, the subconsciousness becomes habitually discordant. And if so, sooner or later, this discord is manifest in the disease of one or more of the bodily organs or functions which it controls. Let us examine this mental process a little more carefully. Frequently, the conscious mind becomes discordant over business or social experiences, 
or over some condition of ill health. This gradually makes the subconsciousness discordant, which in turn manifests itself in disease of the body, and in increased measure, if disease was the original occasion of discord. As a result of this added sense of disease, the conscious mind takes on an increased sense of fear, anxiety, discouragement, grief, etc. This is communicated to the subconsciousness, thus making it still more discordant. And such a mental descent once entered upon, nothing but extreme suffering and death can result unless a way is found to interrupt its course. We learn in Christian science that the one sure and legitimate way of stopping this destructive mental program is to lay hold on God, to govern the feelings according to love, and thus escape from the influence and control of outward or corporeal suggestions of discord. We may not be able to do this all at once, but with a clear understanding of spiritual truth and firm determination, we can do a great deal in the right direction from the very start, and can soon gain a complete victory. Said Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It may be well to consider somewhat in detail how we may make a beginning of right activity. First of all, we must be thoroughly convinced that God is the only cause and creator, hence the only power then that anything which seems to occur as a result of any other so-called power cannot be legitimate or real, and that the human mind can have no true or real thoughts or feelings which it does not receive from God. Said Christ Jesus, The Son can do, think, or feel nothing of himself. But whatsoever he seeth the Father do, think or feel, that doeth the Son likewise. If we clearly perceive and accept this fact, we will determine not to allow ourselves to feel contrary to the nature of God, since in doing so we would manifestly be living, feeling, a lie. To illustrate, Suppose a person were to find himself seriously ill. At once, the disposition to fear and to worry asserts itself. But he who has awakened to the truth of being reminds himself that he has accepted God as the only power. In God there is no reason for fear, hence the apparent physical reasons for it are really no reasons at all and are not to be allowed to govern one, even though he does feel sick. He may for the present be unable to avoid a sense of weakness and pain, though he valiantly contends against them. But in any case, he will not give place to fear. Such conscious activity, based on divine love, will tend strongly to prevent the development of disease. And if the realization of spiritual truth, its law and power, is sufficiently clear, the disease will be destroyed. In any case, the giving of false suggestions to the subconsciousness is avoided, and the consequent aggravation of the disease is obviated. Such mental procedure on the part of the Christian scientist, if it is not sufficient, together with other lines of scientific thought and feeling that he may be holding to cure him, will at least aid in his recovery, and will clear the way for effective reception of the work being done for him by a brother scientist. 
Suppose a near relative or friend has passed away. There is a strong, natural impulsion to grief. But the person who has adopted this new line of activity will at once remember that in God there is no reason for grief. And having accepted this fact, he will not be deceived by appearances or by what human sense claims to be a reason. Therefore, he will not entertain grief. Suppose, to human sense, a near one should prove unfaithful. Then comes the natural impulsion to jealousy, anger, grief, hatred, revenge, and the like. Again, we are reminded that in God there is no reason for any of these feelings, and hence we will not entertain them. We may thus rule out of consciousness all forms of emotional discord, which would ordinarily be incident to business perplexities or reverses, to social relations, to family affairs, or even to the conditions of bodily health. The person who, by thus accepting God as the only ground of reality, succeeds in keeping emotional discord out of consciousness, will cease to contribute the seeds of discord to his subconscious mind. And the discordant phases of the subconscious mind, being no longer fed, soon starve to death. As discordant subconsciousness is thus weakened more and more to the vanishing point, it gradually, and often very rapidly, loses its seeming power to bring forth ills in the body. And for that reason, in part, there is a more or less rapid recovery of health, which, however, is mainly due to a more positive reason to be next discussed. Many students of Christian science find themselves, at the start, obliged to accept God as the working principle, purely on the basis of revelation in the Bible and on the basis of logic, since they have little feeling of or for God. But if they really trust the validity of their logic and accept God as the only reason, and on that basis rule out discordant emotions in the manner we have described, they soon find themselves loving the principle, the God whom they prove in daily experience to be their helper in casting out the ill feelings which formerly vexed them. And with increasing experience, this sense of love grows apace. Moreover, following this course, they soon find themselves maintaining an uninterrupted peace of mind in a manner before unknown. As the conviction dawns upon them that, through reliance on God as the only explanation of reality, they can really hold their peace against various human temptations to discord, they find themselves experiencing a sense of power, of self-government, and of joy which they had not known before. The peace, joy, and love which come into their experience when God is thus proven to be their helper constitute gold tried in the fire and the riches of the kingdom of heaven. Through continuous reliance upon God, the thought and feeling of God come more and more into the forefront of consciousness, until there is scarcely a moment of the day when one does not have a sense of the divine presence. In proportion as the subconsciousness, being starved and depleted, loses its control over the body, in the same proportion the God-consciousness is developed, and the human sense of body comes under the control of this right sense, 
consciousness of truth and love, and so begins to reflect harmony instead of discord. And this process goes on until the healing is complete. A human being who has been thus freed from subconscious discord and whose God consciousness has been highly developed is largely immune from harm by mental malpractice from others, even without much special work for protection. But those who have not attained a firm and unbroken hold upon God need more frequently to do special work against various forms of malpractice. In this connection, it is easy to answer the question sometimes raised as to wherein Christian science treatment differs from mental science and suggestive therapeutics, and as to why work in science does not amount to the same thing as what is known as giving suggestion to subconsciousness. Methods of treatment by suggestion assume that healing can be accomplished by addressing the subconsciousness with arguments of health and strength made as mere statements and not based on divine truth. The assumption is that, in this manner, a sense of harmony can be injected into the subconsciousness so that it will be reflected in the body. Such an assumption is based on an expectation of filling the subconsciousness with something that it did not previously possess. On the other hand, the Christian science method of work tends to starve and destroy the subconsciousness on its discordant side in the manner already described and tends to build up in the person a God consciousness, which is not subconsciousness, but is, from the ordinary human standpoint, superconsciousness. This spiritual consciousness is humanity's birthright, which, however, can be attained only by earnest endeavor to have that mind which was in Christ Jesus. How interesting and illuminating in this connection is St. Paul's statement, If the Spirit of God, God consciousness, dwells in you, he that same consciousness that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make strong and well your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. God, who is immortal mind, never created any mortal mind, whether conscious or subconscious. Hence, in reality, there is no subconscious mind. Therefore, it cannot be a channel for the transmission of beliefs of heredity, and it cannot be a storehouse for erroneous beliefs or a seat of evil habits. It cannot be a medium for the transmission of mortal thought, feeling, or willpower. It cannot misgovern the body. God alone governs. Note, at the time Mrs. Eddy wrote Science and Health, the word subconsciousness was not in common use. So she used the phrase unconscious mortal mind to express the same idea. For example, see Science and Health, page 409, lines 9 to 15.